بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد رسول الله I begin with the name of Allah All praise belongs to Allah And may peace and blessings be upon the Prophet Muhammad For he is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So up to this point we've explained What the Muslim community affirms about Allah Azza wa Jal Mighty and majestic is he We also explain what the Muslims affirm about the Prophets And about the unseen so now, Imam Nabawi explains, how does a person actually become a Muslim? That's the topic of discussion in this lesson, inshallah ta'ala. Imam Nabawi, he writes in his book, Al-Maqasid, may Allah have mercy on him, the pillars of Islam consist of five things, the two testifications without which one's Islam is not valid, the prayer, obligatory almsgiving, pilgrimage, and fasting in Ramadan. In a well-known hadith, the Prophet wasallam he likened the religion to a desert tent held up by five pillars. The first of the five pillars of Islam is the Shahadatan, more commonly known as the Shahadatain, which can be translated as the two testifications. I testify that there is no God except God, and I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of God. If a person utters the Shahadatain out loud, he enters the fold of Islam. It can be said in any language, as long as it's uttered out loud, knowing what he's saying when he says it. Now here when Imam Nawawi says, without which one's Islam is not valid, meaning a non-Muslim who wishes to embrace Islam has to utter the shahadatain. Even if he just says it to himself, that's fine. No one else has to hear it. He can whisper it to himself, that would be perfectly fine. He is a Muslim. As for a child born into a Muslim household, this child is considered a Muslim by the Muslim community, by default. Even if this child grows up and never ever says the Shahadatain, he is automatically treated as a Muslim. Assuming he doesn't do anything publicly or say anything publicly that would suggest otherwise. Your parents are Muslim. You seem to be Muslim. Alhamdulillah, you're Muslim. Now, there's something worth mentioning here. The religion of Islam is a communal religion. There are certain acts of worship that can't be done if there isn't a larger community, such as giving zakat. A Muslim can only give zakat if there's a fellow Muslim who needs zakat. So historically, when a person accepts Islam, this was a big deal. It was sort of like becoming the citizen of a new country. Becoming the citizen of a new country isn't something that you just do on a whim. There's a lot of ramifications that arise from this decision. And so it's a big deal when someone becomes a Muslim. When a person becomes a Muslim, alhamdulillah, this affords you a lot of amenities that you previously didn't have. For example, as a Muslim, you can now join the congregational prayer. In fact, you can lead the congregational prayer. You can now marry someone from the Muslim community. And upon passing away, if you are a Muslim, you are honored with a Muslim burial. So, with all of that said, the Muslim scholars, they list certain preconditions for a person who wishes to become a Muslim. So, Imam Manawi states these as follows. The preconditions for entering Islam are, number one, reaching puberty. A person must have reached puberty because otherwise, he or she is not considered morally accountable, what we called mukallif a few lessons ago. Again, it's sort of like becoming a citizen of a new country. A minor is not allowed to do that. You need a guardian to do that for you. Likewise, when you become a Muslim, there's a lot of responsibilities that come with that. And so if you're a child, you probably wouldn't be able to physically or mentally fulfill these responsibilities. Number two, being sane. Being sane means the ability to discern good from bad, right from wrong, benefit from harm. As for this phrase here, except if under subjugation, we'll return to that shortly, inshallah ta'ala. Number three, receiving the message of Islam. This is pretty obvious. A person cannot accept Islam before hearing about what Islam is. So logically, if you want to become a Muslim, it's assumed that you've heard what Islam is in the first place. Number four, it must be done out of volition. When a person accepts Islam, this must be done out of his own free will without being coerced. It's impermissible to threaten someone by saying something like, Become Muslim or I'll kill you. A'udhu Billah. May Allah protect us from such things. If a person were to accept Islam under the threat of violence, his Islam would not be considered valid. He has to enter the religion by his own free will, his own free volition. 
Number five, pronouncing the two testifications in their proper order, in tandem, uttering I testify in each of them, knowing their intended meaning, and stating them unequivocally. Now, if you've ever seen someone accept Islam, usually after the Juma prayer on Friday at a mosque, you'll notice that the imam will often ask things like, do you know what this means? Is anyone forcing you to do this? This is to ensure that the person knows what he's doing and that there isn't any kind of funny business here. Especially given all of the things we just mentioned. This person can now lead the prayer. He can go to Hajj. He can marry a fellow Muslim. He can receive Sikhat. So this is just to make sure that there's no ambiguity about what's happening here. So, if a person utters the Shahadatain while fulfilling all of these conditions, he is recognized as a Muslim by the Muslim community. Alhamdulillah. And no one has the right to question his conviction or second guess his sincerity. As long as he doesn't publicly say or do anything that suggests otherwise, he is embraced as a fellow Muslim. Now let's go back to some of the nitty gritty details here. Some of the things we're about to discuss is a bit theoretical in nature, particularly for us living in the 21st century. But understanding these details will give you an appreciation for how the Islamic system of law works. So, let's go back. We said one of the conditions is being sane, except if under subjugation. If a person accepts Islam, he or she is only responsible for adhering to the sacred law, also called the Sharia, if this person is free. What do we mean by free? Meaning, this person is not under the subjugation of another human being. So, if a Muslim is held captive against his will, he could potentially force him not to fast during the month of Ramadan, for example. And this captive, he would have no choice but to comply out of fear for his life. And unfortunately, this is actually a reality in certain parts of the world. There's some Muslims who are actually being forced to eat food during Ramadan by some type of oppressive regime. In this kind of scenario, this Muslim, he is not held responsible for not fasting. On the Day of Judgment, he will be excused, because if it were up to him, he would have fasted. But because someone else is subjugating him, he has no choice in the matter. And the same thing applies to a Muslim prisoner who is denied basic human rights, for example. Or even to a Muslim teenager. If someone accepts Islam and his parents are not Muslim, and they force him to do things that he wouldn't want to do, same thing applies. Now, another detail. One of the preconditions is that a person accepts Islam done out of volition, except for an enemy combatant or an apostate. Let's describe these things here. The term enemy combatant. In Arabic, they call this a harabi. An enemy combatant refers to someone who is actively fighting against the Muslims during a war. We previously said that a Muslim must accept Islam by his own volition, by his own free will. He can't be forced, he can't be coerced. But imagine this scenario. Let's say there's a Muslim who's fighting a non-Muslim on the battlefield. And the Muslim gets the upper hand over him. And this Muslim, he raises his sword in the air and he's about to deliver the final blow. And the non-Muslim, he says, I testify there's no God but God and Muhammad is the messenger of God. Now, from the outside looking in, this sounds like this person is saying this out of duress. He's just saying this because he doesn't want to die. People will say anything not to die. So he's not really sincere when he said the Shahadatain, right? According to the religion, no. You have to take this person at his word. There's a famous incident where Usama bin Zaid, one of the companions of the Prophet, anhu, may Allah ta'ala be pleased with all of them. Usama bin Zaid, he was fighting on the battlefield. And he was about to strike down a non-Muslim fighter. And at the last moment, he said the Shahadatain. But Usama bin Zayd didn't believe him. He killed him anyway. Because this is in the middle of a heavy combat, this person could be pretending. Imagine if Usama puts his guard down, and then the man, surprise, attacks him. So Usama bin Zayd, he did what he did. Later that day, this incident, it was related to the Prophet wasallam, And the Prophet became visibly angry which is not something that happened too often. So Usama bin Zaid, he explained himself. He said, this person was only pretending to become a Muslim so that I would spare his life. He would have killed me, if anything. And the Prophet, alayhi salam, he said, did you open up his chest to see? Did you open up his chest to see? Meaning, how do you know what was in his heart? 
Usama bin Zayd, he was very disturbed when he heard this and he began to walk away. And as he walked away, the Prophet salam, he kept repeating, did you open up his chest to see? Did you open up his chest to see? And he said it louder and louder so that Usama can keep on hearing him as he walked away. So this shows you that we always give a person the benefit of the doubt when it comes to accepting Islam. As Muslims, we're supposed to interact with people based on their outward actions without prying into their inward intentions. So if this person says they're shahadatain, then we embrace them as a Muslim. Maybe he said this just to save his own life. But alhamdulillah, welcome to the religion of Islam. Again, this is largely theoretical in our age, but this demonstrates the level of mercy that we are supposed to have even on the battlefield in the middle of combat. Likewise, with an apostate, what's called in Arabic amurtad, someone who was previously Muslim and he publicly renounces his Islam. For example, he stands in the middle of the city square and he yells out, Hey everybody, look at me. I'm no longer a Muslim. Historically, if a person were to do this, this is tantamount to someone holding up his U.S. passport and burning it in front of everybody, or grabbing an American flag and tearing it up in order to declare to everybody, look at me, I'm no longer an American. If someone were to do this, he could be arrested for treason, and the same thing applied in historical Muslim societies. An apostate is effectively renouncing his allegiance to the Muslim community. So he may be jailed, or put under house arrest, or excommunicated, or depending on the situation, even worse than that. So because of these consequences, in apostate, he may later decide to change his mind and take back his statement. I'm going to be excommunicated? Actually, never mind. I was just playing. I'm still a Muslim. <laughs> I was just playing, everybody. Don't mind me. Again, just like the enemy combatant on the battlefield, this person could be insincere. Maybe he just wants to avoid being punished in a court of law. But as Muslims, we must take him at face value. You profess to be a Muslim again? Okay, you're a Muslim again. This is theoretical for most of us living in the present day, but it gives you a glimpse of how the religion works. So then, Imam Nawawi, he says, pronouncing the two testifications in their proper order and in tandem, affirming anything previously denied of the religion along with them. If someone accepts Islam, and he was previously part of a religion that has a certain belief, which is famously known to be antithetical to Islam, then he may be asked to disavow this previous belief, along with uttering the shahadatain. Again, you may see this in a mosque. If a Christian wishes to accept Islam, the imam may ask him to say, I testify that there's no God except God. I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of God. And I testify that Jesus is a prophet of God. Or something else, like, I testify that God has no mother, no father, no son, or something else to that effect. This is to dispel any misconception that this person may have previously had. But with that said, this is a matter best left to one's discretion, especially since a person doesn't have to utter the shahadatain publicly in order to become a Muslim. As we said, a person can be sitting in the comfort of his own bedroom, he can say the shahadatain, no one else has to ever hear him. You're a Muslim, alhamdulillah. But sometimes, people do it publicly. They go to the mosque, they go to the Juma prayer, and when that happens, certain things like this may come into play. And then Imam Nawawi, may Allah Ta'ala shower him with mercy, he says, and stating them unequivocally. Meaning, a person has to say the actual words of the Shahadatain. It's not enough to say, I believe in what the Muslims believe. Or, do you testify that there's no God but God? And he says, yes I do. No, a person has to actually say, I testify that there is no God except God. I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of God, so that there's no ambiguity. It's like when a bride and groom get married, and the person officiating the marriage, he says, repeat after me, I do solemnly swear to take this person as my lawfully wedded wife, and so on and so forth. Since this is a very important commitment, it has to be clear what is and isn't being said here. You can't say, do you want to marry her? And the person says, sure, why not? No, it has to be official. I want to marry her in front of everybody. I am saying these words. Likewise, when saying the shahadatain. Imam Nawawi, he makes one final point in this section. As we said, a person is born to Muslim parents. He's considered Muslim by default, even if he never utters the shahadatain publicly. Aside from that, it's religiously obligatory for a Muslim to utter the shahadatain at least once in his lifetime. So Imam Nawawi, he says, Uttering, I testify that there is no God except God, and I testify that Muhammad is God's messenger, is obligatory at least once in a lifetime, and it is highly encouraged to do so frequently. 
Its meaning is to affirm Allah's oneness and the messengerhood of our leader Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so, if someone has prayed at least once in his entire life, one single prayer, then this obligation is fulfilled because we utter this shahadatain in the second rak'ah of every single prayer. So if you've ever prayed before, then you've already fulfilled this obligation. But as Imam Nawawi says, it's highly recommended to say the shahadatain frequently. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. I testify that there is no god except God and I testify that Muhammad is God's messenger. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ala ashabihi wa ala atba'ihi wa ala man walahu hatta yawm qiyamah wa sallam tasliman kathira.